greetings to everyone and, and uh, in particular our panelists. Uh, and so perhaps Mohan, you could tell us what's happening in uh, with COVID. What, what is the current situation? Okay, so um, we got early infections in March from from Austria and uh, Italy in particular, and we were quite lucky so far that uh, uh, the restrictions were were put put uh, in effect very early on, and these were quite effective. And um, with schools and universities were closed down, and social distancing, which actually comes quite natural for the Finnish people, and uh, Right now we have a death toll of less than 300 uh, uh, patients and right now we have about 32 uh, patients in the ICU. Uh, the population is a 5.5 million in Finland so we are doing quite well. And uh, right now it's uh, there is a kind of a concentration of the COVID cases in in Helsinki. So actually what, what they are now, now discussing whether we can uh, suffocate the, the virus totally here in uh, Finland like it was um, uh, achieved in uh, New Zealand. So we have to wait and see but actually we are quite on alert. The schools have uh, opened the doors again and now also the those restrictions we had will be will be now liberated. So uh, it's too early to say uh, what will happen in, in autumn for uh, obviously but I think we are buying time and uh, let's see what will happen then, then in the autumn but uh, hopefully there's the possibility that, that uh, we can keep the level at, at that stage. So for the normal uh, operation, we are down to about 60 to 70 percent of normal normal capacity uh, for ear surgeon surgery, and uh, we we seen uh, problems in 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 getting patients in because they are quite afraid to come to the hospital, and uh, this has this has sometimes um, put put some um, problems problems with with getting the patients actually but but we are quite quite lucky as I said so it's it's quite quite a good situation right now here uh, sorry uh, the I think we also had were lucky because we had a late start uh, and we got our lockdown in quite early um, it has helped now uh, but we have had some huge challenges in you know, a country of this size uh, we had a huge uh, migrant uh, worker population, you know, which had been displaced because of the lockdown, and there was obviously a, a you know a, a mass movement and that added on to the challenges. But overall, our uh, you know we are, we are approaching somewhere around uh, nearing hundred thousand uh, infected cases, and we've had about three thousand or so mortality. So something like three percent mortality was not too bad. Uh, and uh, in my state of uh, 70 million people, uh, southern state, uh, mortality has been particularly less. Now we, we have less than uh, something like 70, 75 uh, mort cases, uh, you know, mortality. So overall, uh, it's been uh, quite uh, very successful. I think we are now gradually released, coming out of our lockdown in phases. Uh, so we have, we have now entered the fourth phase of lockdown where they have allowed uh, some uh, limited public transport and uh, like Alex said we are also down to about 50-60 percent per capacity autological surgery. Uh, mostly doing uh, emergencies but a few uh, elective cases slowly we are starting now with, with precautions. Okay Rob, uh, we have uh, Professor Leonard uh, now connected. Um, I suggest that we move on to him, if you agree. Sure. Certainly. Go ahead. As of Beijing is okay. Beijing now no new uh, new patient. Uh, just uh, transfer from the abroad to Beijing. A few of them 
uh, isolated and uh, everything. Now, you know, in my room, we, we can without mask. Okay, it's good. Here's a 14 minute video. This is a mastoid approach to the uh, uh, opening the epi tympanum here, and I believe this is a to be a med L implant uh, in a patch with uh, under lo local. It is a metal uh, flex 28. Yes, metal flex 28, and uh, as you, you can see, almost opening the mastoid, he has uh, a dental lateral canal anteriorly there, and, and it clearing the cellular bone away from behind. Yeah. Adding the cortical bone uh, posteriorly a little. Now working towards where the uh, facess will be. So now we're the sound along the line of the facial nerve. Scalloping the external artery canal there. Often there's a point of bleeding there which indicates approximately the genu of the, the facial nerve to be. So to there with the genu of of the facial nerve ingenue. A lot of cellular bone down into the tip. So now he's working the line of what, what may be caught a temp coming up or where the the uh, along still along of the facial nerve. Now, well, to a tip. Skeletonizing the external auditory canal, of the bowel, taking the cellular bone off. And now starting to work a lot of nerve itself, and I would think through the facial. Yes. It's a dentist nerve in its distinct segment. a small burr, looks like a diamond burr there, uh, in the buttress, and then, then progressively open through the facies. Now, so we use some uh, gel foam with, with uh, perhaps with adrenaline or some hemostasis. Now, the superior portion of the facial recess into the butt and have visualized the stapedius tendon. Aggressively, the burr as work towards the edge of the 
a short recess. Just see the edgy round niche there now. So the lateral act of sinus tympanizer in front of the earth in order to visualize the round wind. And a smaller burn is now used to take the lip round window niche off to visualize the round window membrane. So nice round window membrane there. See the orientation of the round window inferior to the uh, pyramid of the pedius tendon. So now the small end looks less than one millimeter, or is being used to create a little slot known at the, the uh, inner aspect or the, the apex of the facial recess. This is where you secure the cables. Now using a larger cutting burr, and I presume this will create a seat for the uh, pack plant. Using burnout for basis and to uh, smooth any irregular bone. Sorry, Sorry to interrupt, interrupt Robert, Robert. We're, we're getting, getting a bit of cross talk, talk that's coming, coming from, from China, China, I think. If uh, possibly uh, uh, mimic the microphone, Professor Lee. So now Thomas is being a, a, a bridge between the well or the implant and the asteroid. So then placing the uh, implant in position. And this is all on the local, uh, Rob? Up uh, below. So uh, this is a tricky operation to, to get the electrode through that bridge without causing any da damage. That's come through night, and obviously we'll secure the front of the 
uh, to very securely, it's not too great. Now he's in a uh, capillary pipette to take a peri level. So stab it through the round membrane, then uh, uh, peri lymph is connected in the capillary. From sample four, and adding an incision in the round with the bed, using hypodermic needle to make vertical incision. And in fact, actually, a more of a cruciate incision. So. This is the electrode itself, which he's obviously taking care of. Here to now, using uh, forceps, we hold the electrode cable just proximal to the active electrode it's then the electrode is centered on the round wind and uh, slowly introduced So, so Rob, what, what sort of the time, time frame, frame do we use to uh, introduce that? Is there any sort of tips on that? Well, I think uh, every surgeon does it different, and uh, it's good for discussion as to it makes uh, what sort of it may or may not make. Thomas has said it relatively slowly now, as if it's a full full insertion of the electrode and that the hub exactly at the uh, round window and the electrode cable is clips quite nicely into the slot that he's created in the uh, facial that's there which nicely stays the electrode inside the cock and then he's carefully Looping the the electrode cut underneath the overhang uh, down into the mast or the fact that would tip. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Looks like he's going to take a little, little bit of more to seal around the uh, ostomy or around the round window. Chris. Yeah. yeah. Aye. Aye. Thomas is going to join you as a panelist in the Okay, the great. Meeting. That's, That's fine. fine. He should be there. So and then, then he'll, he'll be able to commentate over the Zoom, will he? Yes. Okay, okay. good. If you, if you bring, bring him in, in that'd, that'd be great. great. Did, you Did you hear that, that Rob? I did. It, uh, Thomas is... So, so, so once, once we get, get Thomas, Thomas on Zoom, Zoom we'll let, let you know. know. But if, if you, you keep, keep commentating now, that'd, that'd be great. great. Yeah. So he's... A little bit of muscle hard from uh, the bigger incision to pack inferiorly at this point between the uh, edges of the cochleostomy or the round window and the electrode. And it looks like he's done the conferentially around the electrode. And, and uh, it looks like he's finished. Uh, it's more or less the same thing, uh, Rob. You know, I use more of the same technique. Um, I, I do like to have a small uh, uh, slit in the inferior uh, 
uh, part of the patient is to uh, keep the electrode in position. Uh, I don't make a tunnel, but I, I make kind of a slit in the uh, mastered cortex. It's just highlighted. Uh, and then I use a, a bit of bone pate at the end of it all to line up the, uh, the, the electrode uh, on the mastered uh, surface. So I use some bone pate at the end to cover up. That's the only thing. Um, I make a much smaller incision in the round end of the right? um, and uh, I introduce it a bit but essentially the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. So I see has joined us. Did, did you see the video? No, uh, no. Yeah, we, we see Alex Huber has joined us. Good morning. Yes. And, uh, Had some technical problems. Sorry. I can I can explain to you what happened, but uh, I'll do that at the, at the moment. It's not your fault at all. Uh, I could see that someone else was trying to uh, to get onto your line as well, who is supposed to be there tomorrow and not today. Uh, <laughs> well done, Wilco, for putting through the technical issues. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, yeah. Okay. In uh, in. Uh, uh, when 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 Thomas uh, joins us, we can ask him his rationale, local anaesthetic versus local anaesthetic. My understanding is, is that that the elaborate and thus. Um, so I'd like to ask the panelists how to investigate with laboratories in terms of imaging. What does the investments that are Needed. Oh, you can you, Chris? Chris, comment? I, I, I think I saw Thomas on the in the uh, attendees list. <laughs> oh, we have uh, to get him out, out of there. Is the attendees is that okay? okay? We, we, okay. We, we need, need to get, get him out of there. I will try, try and do that. that. Okay. Me too. Me too. Sorry, sorry, Rob. Continue. Okay, okay I'll, I'll put, put Thomas, Thomas in and allow him to talk, talk now. now. Okay, Tom, are you with us? Can you? I can hear you. Good. Good. And, and we can hear you now nicely now, Thomas. Thomas. Unfortunately, we missed you during the um, the video, but Rob, Rob was talking to us. Rob's sound, unfortunately, was very, it's very poor and jittery. Um, and also, Dr. Mohan from India, the sound is very poor. The other panelists, it sounds pretty good. So uh, I don't know if there's anything we can do from Melbourne to improve that. Well, we need to put um, a new line in, uh, Chris. Uh, so, if someone is uh, volunteering to put a new cable from uh, Holland to uh, Australia, that would work. Okay, okay. I, I just wonder whether it might be worth getting maybe Alex to just share because, because then we'll have better quality sound. Is it? I mean, not to be no, no, rude, no, but I wonder what that might no, be worth doing. What do you know. think? Would you be up for that, Alex? Sure, uh, I'll I'll be happy to try. Yeah, I had some. Uh, yeah, I think that'd be good because your sound is so much better. better. Okay, good. So, um, so the question, if I if I understood uh, correctly from Rob, was um, whether uh, anybody uses um, local versus general anesthetic, and what was the advantages and disadvantages of uh, both techniques? So um, I think that's right. And if, if you can maybe specifically direct your questions to the panelists so that they know when they should be talking, that would be helpful. I think. And, and can you unmute uh, Lennox? Constantly, Chris, please. Yeah. He's, He's not, not muted. muted. Okay. Hello. Thomas, you can speak Hello. now, Thomas. Can you Hi. hear me? Yeah, can no, that's great. great. It's really, it's really nice, nice to hear you. you. Okay, Welcome. Great. So thank you, Rob. You made a great job in, in um, commenting the video. That's what I got. Oh, very nice. And, uh, <laughs> so, and um, first of all, I want to uh, give credit to, to Arno mm. Dietz from Finland because he educated us in doing cochlear implantation on the local. Um, and so we basically adapted this concept and um, I use it now in, in a number of patients. So actually the patients uh, report that uh, that is uh, somewhat good for them. They uh, actually hear everything, uh, what um, we want them to hear. For instance, when we switch to the plant, they can exactly tell you um, that they can hear and also depending on the contact you activate 
um, they have a kind of um, pitch sensation. So that means like phonotopic information. And then, uh, also in residual hearing, the patient can tell you once you display a sound to them, uh, whether it's changing. So that indicates that you do, for instance, some damage to the residual hearing or not. I mean, this, uh, and they, they like not to undergo general anesthesia. So that's basically the, the, the pro side. The, the con side is that you have to have a cooperative patient and that the anesthesiologist is really working with you. Huh? Uh, and that they really monitor the patient uh, and give them the right um, drugs so that they are still awake but not afraid of pain. That's good. That's Thomas, can I just say there's a question from the uh, Zoom room about, and this is for all of the panel, about the use of steroids pre-insertion of the cochlear implant, and is there any role for intratympanic steroids during, before electrode insertion? What's the feeling of yourself and the panel on steroids? Well, we use it systemically, yeah? Systemic steroids. But no intratympanic? No intratympanic. Okay. Yeah, same with that. And yeah. yeah, same with us as well. Yeah, same, like, same with me as well, yes. Okay, okay Alex, I'm going to hand it back, back to you. You can keep, keep sharing. sharing. If you just want to have a general discussion about Cochrane and Plants okay, for the so audience, that would be great. Um, so, so let's um, let's move back a little bit again to um, uh, local versus uh, general anesthetic. So, um, Arno, you said, or you you apparently using always um, or or just partly um, local anesthetics, and and can you uh, explain a little bit in which cases uh, you prefer local over general? Well, the, um, I think we need a corporate patient, and um, mainly the patient um, has to be told that this is possible, and that you really give him the confidence that he uh, is able to lay on the table for one and a half hours or so. Um, and we also have some visual information uh, showing him what's next step, uh, and also um, that, that he, he can, can respond, respond to us or speak, speak with us. I think that is uh, important. So then I'll make, make them comfortable in lay, lying, lying down. And, and I think, I think uh, these, these patients, patients you can identify and, and they basically undergo it. Some, Some of them are afraid of having uh, general <laughs> anesthesia. This, this patient I showed you suffered um, bilateral deafness from COVID-19. COVID uh, actually uh, uh, an actual case and the anesthesiologist told us we can't But um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I noticed that you used uh, gel foam um, at um, at the facial recess. Was that local anesthet anesthetic on that? To um, on, in stapy surgery, I noticed that with um, with local anesthesia around um, the corda, there is sometimes um, a, a bit of uh, of pain when when you touch that. Uh, that's, that's true. Uh, that's, that's exactly, exactly what, what we did to, to uh, make, make additional local anesthesia. anesthesia. What, what we, we also, also do is to inject local anesthetics uh, through the tympanic, tympanic membrane uh, at, at the beginning of the surgery, surgery which, which also anesthetizes the mucosa in the middle area. Otherwise, it's a read lock, because that is? Yeah, well, well they, they have, have some pain if you come, come to the corda. That's, that's right. right. Uh -huh. And Thomas, Thomas, can I just ask, ask if you inject, inject local anesthetic through the tympanic, tympanic membrane, membrane, do you, you ever get, get any facial palsy? palsy? No, um, actually, that's, uh, we do also staples under local, and the injection mode is so that you don't go to the area of the facial nerve. I mean, you could have it if you have an exposed facial nerve. So, for instance, that uh, there is no uh, bony coverage on the nerve, you could get it, but it's transient. I mean, after two, three hours, it's gone. Yeah, yeah, I realize, I realize that, that, but do you ever see it? it? Do you see, see that, that at all? We have seen it from, from time to time, yeah. 
No, no, but it's, I, I think, think something, something which is um, transient and you can explain it to the patient. Yeah. We have a question from Dr. Tsang in Hong Kong asking if you, you make a tunnel for your electrode. Do you do that on your pediatric patients? And if you do, how do you avoid dural injury? Mm -hmm. So we do it in all patients, in all cases, because always at the sinus dura angle, you have a big bone. And we use uh, uh, diamond uh, burst for that. So also in, in pediatric cases, uh, even under the age of one, you still can create this tunnel. And uh, we do it under um, this uh, precaution, um, and then you can avoid it. Um, uh, that it's more the bleeding that can occur, but uh, you can um, handle this with uh, local measures uh, like uh, some bone wax or just also uh, drilling in a dry um, moat uh, to, to stop it. Hello, Tom. This is John Oates, who's the co-host. Um, we just had a question from our good friend, uh, Prof. Chris Rain, who, as you know, is in Bradford. Obviously, the sun's come up there and they've woken up. Um, he's asking, what are your thoughts or the panel's thoughts on securing the implant if a bridge is not used? Well, what we then do is that probably we make a, a trough. We try to uh, undercut the bone and uh, bring it in there. Or we use sutures that cross where the tunnel should be just to keep it in place. Because um, what we see with the large series of implantations, one of the major complications nowadays is the migration of the implant. So the implant moves somewhat downward and uh, forward, and then you get all problems associated with that. Um, so therefore, for us, it's crucial to make the bone bend and secure the implant right where it passes, where the electrode passes into the mastoid. Right, and then one other, one other question, which I suppose is probably one of the most important ones we're going to be answering over the next two days. Um, Kiran Jumanji um, asking us, uh, uh, saying what a nice video. Could you give some indication of how you are modifying the procedure because of COVID? Oh, well, that's a, that's a good, that, this was a patient who already had COVID before. So we, we think, we thought he uh, basically is no longer uh, infected. And what we do in our uh, nowadays uh, in our surgeries is just to, to wear the FFP2 masks. Uh, we have uh, then uh, the glasses, protection glasses, and also this uh, astronaut caps. Um, and some uh, that's basically what we what we use. Um, and and for all patients, and also the mastoid surgery, we do in the same way. So no no additional things uh, that have been proposed by other colleagues. Can I, uh, I've got a few, got a few questions, questions just for the panel. Perhaps we could ask Arno to start off. Um, uh, Dr. Wahid is asking, what are your criteria for cochlear implantation in adults in terms of hearing loss? And do you have an age cutoff? Then maybe we can go through the panel, starting with Arno. Arno. We've lost our load. So maybe Thomas, you can start with that. Uh, so the question was on, on um, hearing preservation. Um, and uh, what well, we just about gen general criteria for cochlear implantation, implantation, hearing thresholds, yeah, and, uh, and age, if there's any age cutoff. OK, so that's in, in adults. We, we basically look uh, on the um, uh, under aided conditions at 65 decibel presentation level. The monosyllable word score should be equal or less than 50%. Uh, that is our criterion for cochlear implant candidate uh, uh, each year. Uh, I lost you. Do, do you have any age cut off? Uh, age cut off not, no. Um, actually, we also have implanted patients at the age of 90. So some, some of the, the grand grandmas are very important for the family and uh, the family support. So uh, they must hear. That's just one thing. thing. And downwards in children, children, we go on objective, objective measures. measures. So if they have no ABR response, no autoacoustic emissions uh, on both ears, and it's, um, then we would go for implantation. And we go uh, below one year, but we would say between six months and 12 months. Below six months, 
It's only if you have post-managetic deafness with the risk of obliteration that we also would do it under the age of six months. Because then the risk for the, for the child is um, increased for this elective surgery uh, to all these known factors like immaturity of the pulmonary system and the small blood volume they have, etc. Okay, I don't know, John, I see, we seem to have lost the main group of panelists at the moment. Wilco, are you there? Can you bring them back in? Because we'd like to ask Arno and Alex and Dr. Lee, all the uh, Mohan and Rob, all their Chris? criteria. Chris, I can do hear you, hear you me? now. That's better. So maybe we could go to Arno now no, no. and ask for the criteria. Uh, Fra Franco, Franco has pushed Arno out because Franco is too early. Franco, you're not supposed to be in this session yet. <laughs> See. Okay, well, let, let's, get, let's go to Alex Hoover. Okay. And Alex, if you can tell us your criteria for cochlear implantation in Zurich. Well, let's see if he's here. Um, I'm not sure if Alex is here either, because we, we have a, co a couple of people that can't wait, and they are connecting uh, at this point. Well, whilst I'm still here, I'll... Uh, then in Melbourne, the area is very similar to Germany. We have uh, China dialing in. We have all people's uh, people dialing in wanting to participate, Chris. So okay. Uh, well, we have Dr. Lee. Let's try Dr. Lee from uh, China. Okay. So in China, for a very young child, less than six months, routinely be able to do their implant. But it depends. Sometimes um, it's balanced. Under one year, it's some of them we can do cochlear implant. Some of them we cannot do. It depends on patient development. But for adults, just like uh, Professor Dyer, things the criteria is the same. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Mohan, could you uh, give us your criteria? Yeah. Uh, the uh, the age-wise, I mean, I have no limits. I'm the oldest patient I have implanted is 88 years old when I implanted. And generally, the youngest we take is about nine months. More than the uh, age, I think the weight of the baby is, is very important too, because our anesthesiologist like to have a, a baby with at least about eight kilograms because they say below that uh, you know the hemodynamic reflexes are not very well to uh, the uh, uh, criteria in adults generally we uh, have 70 decibels uh, in the audiometric tonogram and uh, less than uh, 40 in the speech discrimination score but more important we rely quite a lot on aided cortical potentials we do a lot of that uh, we fit in the hearing aid and, and test for cortical potentials, and that gives us a very good idea about the benefit of the patients of the hearing aid, particularly with speech uh, information. Uh, and if it's not very good, then of course, uh, you know, we, we can relax our criteria a bit. Uh, but generally, that's the criteria that we use for adults. And we see Arno is back, uh, Chris. Yeah, Arno, Again, maybe you could, you could answer, answer the question. question. So, so it's basically, basically Arno, your, your criteria, criteria for cochlear implantation in terms of hearing thresholds and any age uh, limits on, on either way. Well, actually, we don't have any uh, age limitations. Uh, in the former times, before I, I uh, uh, did the local anesthesia stuff, uh, comorbidity was obviously. Uh, uh, reason why not to perform a cochlear implantation but right now because we are doing it in actually in in very many cases nowadays in local anesthesia this has made the uh, operation much more safer for the especially for the elderly patients and uh, therefore actually we cannot have any any criteria obviously if you are a patient with um, with progressive dementia and uh, is living in a senior house housing, then it it's not not a good candidate for a cochlear implantation, obviously. But but if they are uh, 
uh, home dwelling, as you said, uh, I, I think uh, you you should go forward to it if, if you don't get any good results with a hearing aid, actually. Uh, with respect to thresholds, uh, that's a tough question because we have so a large variety of of uh, different etiology and and therefore it's hard to hard to put some some uh, threshold criteria. If you look for uh, Meniere's disease, for example, they have quite good re uh, thresholds. So um, it so so actually we we go with a with kind of functional hearing uh, uh, criteria and. Uh, we we do we do speech in noise testing and and if we see that that the patient is uh, having problems in normal life with his hearing aid then we definitely would uh, consider cochlear implant. Just to say, um, there's another question coming in again from Chris Rain in Bradford. Um, do the panelists formally test vestibular function preoperatively? Uh, and if they do so, uh, how might that influence their decision regarding surgery? So actually, we do vestibular testing and um, uh, just to see what the function is. Um, but if the patient uh, has a loss of uh, vestibular function, that is not a contraindication. Um, but we follow what patient. Uh, some patients have dizziness, and therefore we want to see uh, whether we can identify factors that are related to that. But it's very difficult to predict. Okay. Uh, we, we do we do vestibular testing. So, yeah. Thanks. So if we ask the panel, if we can ask uh, Alex to address that, perhaps. Uh, Alex uh, is not connected at the moment. Okay, so m maybe Arno, uh, tell us about your vestibular testing pre-op. Uh, in 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 um, well, 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 whenever there's there's any uh, uh, not on routine basis, so to speak. So we have done it uh, in the past, but but right now. Uh, Actually, it is not not a contraindication for for cochlear implantation. And actually, in patients with single-sided deafness, uh, it's quite weird that we have um, experienced that uh, that patients uh, who had had single-sided deafness and also dysfunction of the vestibular system definitely benefit from from the implantation, also in terms of their balance. And uh, this was quite uh, an surprising uh, effect of, of cochlear implantation. Uh, when we switch to uh, soft surgery te uh, technique very early on, in uh, we, we very seldom see uh, uh, balance problems after cochlear implantation. Okay, that's great. Can we go to Dr. Lee now? What do you do uh, mm -hmm. in Beijing? So in Beijing, uh, you know, 90 percent of them are children. For children, routinely, we is very hard for for me to do vestibular test. But for adults, especially for single side deafness, we prefer do vestibular test. Try to get some evidence that predict after surgery the patient will suffer from vertical or something like that. So for very young children, we cannot do some type of vestibular system test. We can only do for adults. Thank you. That's great. And how about in, in Melbourne, Rob? Well, we routinely do vestibular for adults and particularly for second science, want to try and straight that the uh, there to hear that the second ear is their only balancing ear, and then and we would be cautious. But it's very rare that we judge our records because of the comes of the vestibular function test. 
we had to discuss today in fact, uh, because with COVID, testing is more of a problem. So we agreed that we was a combination of V-HIT and testing as preoperative testing and not do caloric testing for the time. Okay. We've got a question here, um, which I'd like to Mohan to address perhaps. Uh, and we'll take it round the panel. The question is from Dr. Ali Youssef, Bashar Ali Youssef, saying, do many as patients get any benefit from cochlear implants in response to, in regards to their vertigo? So perhaps we can start with Thomas on that. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, start with Mohan, if possible. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think, I think that's, that's an excellent question. In fact, we have a, a, a good, a, a quite a big number of many patients who have been implanted. Uh, in fact, what we do is uh, we do uh, uh, combine it with a labyrinthectomy. Mm -hmm. The patient is still symptomatic mm -hmm. vertigo. So we do a labyrinthectomy with simultaneous cochlear implantation. But if you're just doing a cochlear implantation in a patient with uh, many years, uh, they will uh, have some benefit from, uh, you know, definitely have benefit as regards the episodes of vertigo. That's been the general experience, I think, all over. Uh, so, yes, the answer to your question is that if you do cochlear implantation, many patients, uh, uh, many years, actually have a reduction in their episodes of vertigo. And you can also, in very symptomatic patients, combine it with the lab. Okay, perhaps uh, we, we haven't got Alex at the moment, but uh, Arno, could you comment on that? So cochlear implantation in many AS patients and the effect on balance. Yeah, for many AS patients, it's uh, quite difficult to uh, foresee what, what they will, uh, will they be better off with a cochlear implant uh, uh, with respect uh, on their balance. Normally it hasn't, not, such such an effect, but as I said, in in patients with uh, uh, single-sided deafness and 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 dysfunction of of the vestibular system in the affected ear, we have seen uh, uh, patients who who uh, would be uh, with better balance with with an implant than not. And and I think Blake Pepsin has a study uh, in children where they where they uh, uh, saw also. Uh, some some better balance in children with a with a processor on uh, than off, and uh, in some patients I I could could see the same effect. They they were they were trying to do some some um, uh, difficult difficult uh, balancing um, uh, trains with the implant off and implant on, and and they were better better with the implant on so but but you you cannot actually uh, uh, foresee it for sure how how it will work out but but I would say in, in about 50% of patients we see see that the balance also benefit from a cochlear implant now we also have a question uh, about tinnitus uh, and the effect of cochlear implantation on tinnitus so perhaps we can start with Dr. Lee, and what's your experience on the benefits uh, regarding tinnitus? Because, because you know, in China, 90% of them uh, belongs to very young children. So for very young children, sometimes it's not easy for them to describe vertical or tinnitus. Not easy for them to see clearly of course, yeah. suffer from tinnitus. Uh, and 20 percent of them are eye-out patients. The eye-out patient can express themselves clearly. Sometimes they suffer from tinnitus. If if this kind of situation occurs, without talk um, audiologist that might be waiting, try to avoid tinnitus. Thank you. Okay, you need okay. To and Mohan, what's your experience uh, on the uh, tinnitus? Well, I think uh, with the tinnitus, you know, we have to be a little cautious. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, in general, uh, when we restore hearing, uh, the, there is a, 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 a subjective improvement in it. Even if it's not completely abolished, 
uh, they can accept it better but it, it's, it's a very uh, gray area you know and one has to be very cautious generally i tell my patients that you can't bet on it but you know in in, in a uh, good number of patients it just becomes more acceptable and that's how uh, we we found it Chris, in, Moha, in Melbourne, yeah. our experience that uh, tinnitus is very often suppressed, in, and even patients or sighted deafness, tinnitus suppression is useful, but we would recommend on the basis of wanting to suppress tinnitus. A patient who, whose own only problem is the tinnitus, they're the ones who don't know, and so we're happy to do cochlear implant for hearing loss and then have the benefit of tinnitus suppression. But the other way around, patients have been not happy and then to offer cochlear implants for in our experience. And does anybody else have a comment on that, Thomas, about just implanting where tinnitus is the main complaint? Yeah, well, we wouldn't do that because it's very hard to predict that uh, you have a positive effect on it. But those who have single-sided deafness, they often come and ask for um, some um, effect on the tinnitus. So then, of course, you have to speak with them and say, you see, I mean, um, there, in general, there is a suppression uh, of tinnitus with the cochlear implant. Uh, but if this is the primary um, goal for you, then we probably would not do that. But if you say, I also need better hearing, um, because I suffer from uh, the moral uh, situation, then I think uh, it's over. And then you often see that in these patients, all the tinnitus becomes better. So um, I think that's uh, where we should be with our um, consult consulting. Just, uh, just as a, a ballpark figure, I mean, patients with severe tinnitus, how many on average would you expect to get improvement with a cochlear implantation? Well, the, the, the rule is that, um, or not the rule is that our experience, uh, uh, two thirds have a, a very good suppression effect. Um, one quarter has a kind of some effect, uh, but there are also patients who become worse. And this is a minority, uh, five to 6% to our uh, experience. And there we have to be very careful because uh, what else can you do then? I mean, it might be related to trauma um, of the ear with the implant. And it's very difficult then to do, um, I mean, do anything else, um, whatever uh, might be possible. But um, neuromodulation therapy coming up, but that's all, I think, uh, secondary. Okay, we've got a very technical question here about the length of the cochlear duct. And uh, what is the role of the cochlear duct length, not just on results, but also on inner ear trauma and complications mm -hmm. like rollover? That's from Dr. Mon Monis. Okay. Well, just I can take it. Uh, so yeah. we have done intensive studies on the on the role of the cochlear duct length uh, in respect to the trauma you get, um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, obvious yeah. that if you have a short cochlea, then you would insert an electrode, uh, perhaps not in the same length as you would do a long cochlea, because uh, the the um, probability of getting um, let's say, a hearing loss or a procedural hearing loss, um, then uh, it's um, going up with uh, the insertion angle. Uh, so uh, that's, I think, the main thing we found. Uh, so uh, we will always uh, would look on the length of the cochlea, measure it preoperatively, look on the residual hearing, um, and then see how deep we should insert. There is a prediction model we developed to do this. So that's basically uh, what I can say to it. Um, uh, Thomas, is that model, is that automated or is that uh, manual work? Uh, Wilco, you have to work. Uh, uh, so you have to put in the data. <laughs> it's just the audiogram. Uh, then we have this um, algorithm for measuring the cochlear length. Uh, and uh, then you uh, have the two most important parameters uh, to define or to determine how deep you should insert in order to preserve residual hearing and get enough cochlear coverage. Because if you are too shallow, then the hearing is not good. If it's too deep, then you probably risk residual hearing. And that's uh, basically the, um, the so-called yeah, MICI uh, model. Uh -huh. So Thomas, okay, we, we shallow, question, question. shallow is shallow. How deep is too deep? deep for optimal electric station? 
but the, if you go for electric stimulation only, then uh, what we found is that um, 70 to 80 percent coverage is what you need for optimum result. If you are below 70 percent of the cochlear length, then your result with lateral wall electrodes is, is not as good as if you would have 70 to 80 percent. If you go above 80 percent, then probably you um, have also not the same good results. This might be related to some uh, cross uh, scalar uh, um, stimulation, which then um, will give you some channel interaction which you don't uh, desire. And one of the great things, one of the great things about uh, Lion and Doctors United is we truly do go to actually every country in the world. And there's probably a very interesting question here from Mohamed Sani in Nigeria. And he says, do the experienced panelists have any general or specific advice for those trying to develop a cochlear implant service in low and middle income countries? Oh, I realize that's a difficult one. It's just interesting to hear the panelists' views. Um, I, I can take that question. I think, uh, uh, you know, there have been many. Uh, many attempts from different parts of the world. Now, I know for a fact that uh, in South Korea now that they have, uh, uh, you know, started uh, uh, clinical trials, I think, uh, on a, a, a prototype implant which they've developed. In India, we have uh, a prototype in which uh, animal studies are complete and clinical trials have just commenced. Uh, so, uh, and I think in China too, uh, they have some, maybe from the leave in the of it, but I know uh, in, in India there's a, a, an ongoing trial, clinical trial, and also in South Korea there's an ongoing trial. So there's two definite uh, trials that I know which are happening. But John, I think the question was more related to coming a, a co program in comment, I think the thing is you need to have a you need to have audiology who can do assessments and, and do the follow up programming and make the implant working. You need to access to a reliable implant. So there's a number of lecturers providing that now. And the best is to start with people who will do well. In other words, try implant children who are already beyond the age they will get a benefit plant. Start with young children and recently deaf adults who will do well and then it, the success of the, is much, of the program is much more guaranteed. Great, well I think um, summarising that, Rob was breaking up a little bit, but I think the message was very much uh, as we all know, we're very dependent on our audiologists, so you need very good audiological backup. And like all otology, pick a patient who's likely to do well um, before you go and start picking the difficult ones. I don't think the rest of the panel have got any other comments they'd like to make on that. There's an interesting question, question yeah. from Manahar here, saying, uh, Manahar Bantz in Cambridge, that uh, he says, I'm sure you've all seen vertigo occurring in some patients after cochlear implantation, sometimes with changes in impedance. What's the panel's approach to dealing with this? And he wants to know what's going on and how do you treat it? Ian, uh, one, one remark. Uh, why not have him ask the question himself? If you bring him into the panel, he can ask the question himself. Whether I think that'd be nice to see, uh, I mean, maybe not for this question, but for the success, successive questions, it's interesting to see if you can bring them in fit, uh, also in uh, with image. Okay, I pass on the question okay. to the, the panel. Oh, that's okay, correct. So Arno, do you want to take that for a start? Yeah. In Finland? Okay. In, in, su in such cases where we have uh, uh, rise in impediences uh, and, and with uh, vertigo, I, I would go for steroid therapy and to see what what will happen. Um, fortunately, we don't have uh, many of those patients, very sporadically, and and uh, treatment with steroids uh, for for two weeks, for example, uh, may may uh, affect also the um, the impediences. 
obviously you have to check all uh, uh, rule out that that you are experience uh, device failure okay and uh, Thomas what are your thoughts on that I think the, what uh, um, from Mana what, uh, yeah, Mana, yeah. Well, uh, you can have um, increase in impedance, uh, which uh, basically reflects some trauma reaction in the cochlea. And if you go for a traumatic surgery, as we see it, if uh, electrodes are misplaced or we have tip fold over things like that, then uh, you basically can see it. And the, the impedance reflects somehow this uh, reaction. So that is one thing. But on the long term, you also can have it, even so it was initially well placed, that then we must um, have some suspicion that there's either uh, some ongoing uh, inflammatory process um, somehow to the foreign body, or we also can have some infection-related um, increase in impedance. So, for instance, the patient has some flu or so, and then it goes up. But steroids and antibiotics might be helpful. But then there are other patients where we have an ongoing increase which basically might be related to some uh, stimulation patterns. That means if you have an imbalance in charges of your biphasic pulses, that can create then a kind of uh, DC uh, component, which uh, probably um, also induces some electrolysis. So platinum is uh, sort of dissoluted going into the paralymph and can create some cell toxic uh, effects. So that's our explanation for that. Uh, we don't know for sure, but um, that's what we have observed in some patients, very few. Okay, and uh, have we got a comment on that from Dr. Lee about vertigo following cochlear implantation? And your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the, you know, 90% of them belongs to children. So for children, uh, the most uh, uh, common Things for cause vertigo is um, inner ear malformation, such as a large vestibular aqueduct. For this kind of cases, we do recommend some medicine for them, even for very very young children. But for the adults, if the if they suffered from vertigo, uh, just we do something, just follow Professor Lanaz said. But also we recommend the patient to do acupuncture acupuncture some of them some of them are useful thank you okay so acupuncture is uh some do you use that much in in your hearing patients what about for tinnitus do you use acupuncture for that uh, yeah sure Professor Lee. because you know for okay. chinese doctor we have uh, <laughs> acupuncture is, sometimes is useful especially for tinnitus also for low frequency sudden hearing loss is very useful for acupuncture. Thank you. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that because for most of us that's something that we really don't touch on. Hmm? Is, is there anything more you can add about what uh, you actually you do, do with do. your acupuncture? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, because in our hospital we have a long history to call our operate with a Chinese traditional medicine. We cooperated together for almost 20 years. So even for the routine ear surgery, after ear surgery, the patient complained that the, the ear, around the ear, you know, the feeling not good. Also for this kind of situation, we recommend acupuncture for them. It's very useful, maybe one week or two weeks later after acupuncture treatment, the patient feel okay. But for vertical and tinnitus, also low frequencies, hearing loss, sudden hearing loss, is very useful for tinnitus, uh, for acupuncture. So routinely for sudden hearing loss, for low frequencies, we recommend them to do acupuncture first. Then we do some medicine treatment. So, uh, you know, for pressure, young, very young, uh, young patients suffer from tinnitus. Also, we do recommend uh, them to acupuncture, and it's uh, helpful for them. But for high frequencies, uh, hearing loss, sometimes the acupuncture is not as good as low frequencies hearing loss. 
Thank you. Is that okay? Thank you. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's great. Now we've got a um, another question now again for all the panelists. Maybe start with you, Rob. Although we continue have a bit of problems with your sound, I'm afraid. But what are this? We've got a question here from Parvan Singal. What are the various steps you can take to preserve residual hearing? <laughs> What's your advice to preserve residual hearing? Uh, be select the electric. So we would use a thin, uh, flexible lateral wall road, preferably for for residual hearing. We would use a round window membrane approach with simply incision in the membrane, similar to what's demonstrated. And uh, we would nowadays use electric to monitor the hear during insertion. We have steroid okay. areas, guys. Chris, I'd like to point out. Chris, I'd like to point out this is also one of the sessions uh, with Gantz, which is very interesting. Of course, a very relative, relevant topic, eh? but um, for the audience... Okay, uh, it's so very, maybe also... leave that, leave, no, leave no, that no. for the session well, with can, Chris. That's well, not what can I, what can I, I shortly say. comment on that? Would it be possible? Go of ahead. course, of course. Yes, of course. Oh, yeah. no, go for it. Uh, well, a game changer for preserving residual hearing, actually, in patients where you really want to, you know, preserve low frequency hearing and to go for a hybrid or EIS fittings, do it in local because you can monitor the patient's hearing with with a with a uh, insert. You can you can stimulate and then you can go just to the point where the patient is is um, experienced that that the sound is getting attenuated and then you can pull back. Then the sound is going up and then you are just at that point. Where you can, uh, where you can be quite sure that you haven't done any trauma in in the inner ear, and, uh, and, and this know, is, what this depth is that? Well, the right it depends depth. on. Well, it depends on on the uh, individual size of the cochlea, at the individual configuration of the cochlea. Obviously, you can have you to give do some. Average, well, I guess it's some somewhere between 200, 217 and 300 degrees of insertion depth angle. Around that, I, agree I guess. With that, so, you know, I agree with that. The same finding would we have if you go in terms of millimeters, and it's something like um, 18 millimeters um, to 20 millimeters. That's what you normally get as the critical zone. No? And in terms of degrees, I know you already told that. Uh, so I think we we have a good monitoring possibility with this. It's a direct monitoring eh? and uh, tells us exactly what the patient um, has. Uh, and I think that's a, a very um, one of the advantages with this under local. So it seems that local has got a lot going for it. Can I ask the other panelists? Are they generally are they normally using general anaesthetic or local anaesthetic for their cochlear implants? Perhaps start with Mohan. Yeah, uh, we, we do under general anesthesia, uh, all, almost all patients. Uh, in fact, I have actually no experience at all under local anesthesia, but I'm quite impressed by what I'm hearing now. Uh, for residual hearing, what we do is we do intraoperative electrocardiography, uh, and uh, that helps us to monitor the residual hearing. Uh, we, of course, have all the usual, we use as, as special electrodes, the of the hybrid electrodes. We, uh, are very particular about the technique. This is a very dramatic technique for our window. Uh, then we use both IV steroids and also local steroids. Uh, and uh, the uh, insertion has to be very, very slow. And it's very important. Uh, not, uh, it take at least about two to two and a half, three minutes for the like, insertion. So it has to be very deliberate, electrode by electrode. Uh, for uh, the uh, hydrostatic pressure inside the uh, So I think these are all some of the steps. And as Tom said, we use a very small incision in the round window and mainly use the round window technique. But at the intraoperative, we have the cell front the GA. 
Uh, um, Chris, Lee? Chris, Chris, can yeah. I have? Uh, okay, I, saw, yeah. I saw, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm here with Cor Kramers uh, from Nijmegen. I'm very happy when we're, of course, at a safe distance uh, before you get any questions. Um, yeah, I, I saw <laughs> good to see I you, Cor. <laughs> I saw a question uh, from you um, or, or coming by in the chat uh, about robot surgery. Uh, I, th I know that Professor Lennart asked uh, Professor Lefebvre from uh, Liège to do a, a video presentation as well. And uh, if you agree, I would like to add that, say, in, in five minutes, play that. Because um, it's a uh, robot surgery um, for, uh, with cochlear implantation, and I think the question is very relevant. And maybe uh, Professor Lenz can say something about it as well about um, the, ro the chances of robot surgery being less traumatic, uh, as we know that also with the, the Da Vinci robot, etc. But anyway, uh, yeah, no, that'd be very interesting to hear. Just to announce, because he sent in a three-minute video. I'm not sure if he's online, but we'll, we can see it. A three-minute video that will demonstrate uh, the robot surgery. We'll do that in uh, in okay, five I, minutes. I, I, like. I know uh, Thomas is involved in the robotic surgery. Uh, perhaps you can have a few words just before before we see the video. Well, actually, the um, the uh, promise is that uh, we can do it better than. Uh, by hand or manually, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. I think the the main point is that um, we can uh, also uh, predetermine the appropriate trajectory for insertion of an electrode, which is def uh, basically very difficult because insertion of an electrode is done blindly, uh, so we don't know where the electrode might go. And the other one is just the uh, the smoothness of insertion. So if you look on what your hand can do. You have limitations, and um, the robot, per se, can do it uh, with a very low speed, very even, no shakes, uh, no strokes, um, no pre uh, sudden pressure increases. That is the, the, the main promise. The downside is that, of course, you have additional technology to be implemented, and so we have now uh, basically a trade-off between, on one side, being um, effective in terms of time and, and uh, all the costs, and on the other hand, to preserve residual hearing uh, as much as we can and also be atraumatic for uh, preserving cochlear structures for future therapies. So I think there is a role in it. We're um, also working on it with a simplified uh, method how to achieve it uh, using some chicks and so on. But there are already solutions in the field that have been used. And uh, I think uh, Professor Lefebvre probably uh, can tell us more about his experience he already has. Uh, well, can, can we bring Pro Professor Lefebvre in? Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't. I'm checking if he is connected, uh, but I do have his uh, I video. Think he is. And what, how do you? Why do you think? <laughs> yeah, because I've got a message from him. Is that the robot has potential over. to be linked? I've brought him over. Okay, uh, okay, brilliant. So okay. can we give him sound? If, Maybe he can if, speak. Uh, if you put him in the chat, he can talk, and I can show his video. But, okay, uh, Philippe, can you speak to us? Yes, do you hear me? Oh, perfect, yes. perfect, that's great. So you'll be able to commentate through your video now, that's wonderful. Oh, there's, a, there's a commentary actually on the video already. If you want to Just do it personally, you. I can uh, switch off the audio, whatever you like, uh, Philippe. Uh, let the audio on and then I will comment afterwards. Okay, is everybody ready? Here it is. In this short video, no, we will show the use of a robot for a cochlear implantation. The robot that we used is called Robotol and manufactured in France by Collin Company. This is how the robot movements can be observed. You can see here the arm of the robot holding an underscope. The movements are extremely slow and extremely precise. This robot was actually used to introduce cochlear implant. This is an example of an introduction of an electrode into the cochlea. You can see here that the movements are extremely slow and regular. This is a speeded uh, video. Here, this is on this temporal bone, the introduction of the electrode array into the cochlea. This is a very nice and smooth and regular movement. You can see here the electrodes getting into the 
cochlea. This is what's happening in two humans, where you can see here that the electrode array is introduced through the round window into the cochlea. The movements are slow and regular. This is again a speeded video. And you can see here on the right side another example of a speeded video of the electrode array introduced through the round window. The results of the five first patients that we implanted with this robot are pretty good. All patients showed a grade zero of lesion as measured on, with the Kuhn beam CT. And in manually inserted, you can see here that uh, five patients uh, out of 17 showed a grade, a grade one lesion, which is pretty mild lesion, but however, and five patients showed a loss of more than 20 dB out of 17 patients. And here, no patient, only one patient showed just a loss of 23 dB. All the other ones showed a very, very mild loss. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Philippe. Are there any other comments you'd like to make about the uh, robot? Well, your experience? Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> the yes, robot we hear you. actually, uh, we have it about for a few months only. And because of the COVID situation, well, we were stopped to use it. Well, now we started again. Uh, the, the thing is that even now we can go even slower with the introduction of the electrodes as low as 0.1 millimeter per second. The other thing is that this robot can be linked to a navigation system and this navigation system then we can eventually pre-organize and pre uh, uh, to, to have the, the good trajectory to go into the cochlea and this is the next step uh, and this is linked to the navigation system uh, of uh, Colin as well. Uh, so this is the next step with this robot. And we can use it. I mean, the, the other thing is that some people would imagine that, you know, using a robot would take another half hour. It just takes a few minutes. I mean, it's really, it's not more than putting a microscope in. So you just drape it and it's pretty quick system. And Philip, uh, this is after you already do the approach, or are you planning on doing the approach, the whole drilling, also by robots? No, it's it's just the introduction of the electrode. The drilling is done just on a regular way with a regular team, uh, uh, posterior tympanotomy. So it is not the same thing as the Hero robot uh, developed uh, by Cavestaccio in Switzerland, which is different. Okay. Interesting. Did Thank you use you. any electrocochlography during insertion? No, it's the next step. And any other of the panelists of experience of robotics comments to make? Well, actually, we have done it under uh, also with uh, a system uh, which we developed, and um, it's kind of. Uh, the same experience that you really can uh, bring down the speed of insertion uh, to um, to some um, values which are not doable by hand. Uh, if you look on the hand of the surgeon, as you try to bring it down to a very even movement, uh, try to do a, a 10 minute insertion by hand, you would be you would be astonished. I mean, it's not doesn't depend only on the wine you have drunk the night before, but it's also <laughs> <laughs> that uh, there, there are limitations, I mean, just by uh, what your hand can do. Uh, and I think these uh, limitations are, we have to, to realize them. But Thomas, plus, what, you, plus what plus you're plus saying plus then plus is that, that different surgeons have different hearing results? What? The, the thing about the hand is not giving a, a slow, regular movement, you know, there's always little getting in, out, stop, stop, and again, and stop, and again, even if you go very slowly. And the robot can do the things just in a regular way, no stops at all. There has been some measurements done by uh, Olivier Sterker's group in Paris, and they showed this kind of, you know, uh, uh, movement, stop, movement, stop, and the pressure 
goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and this is considered to be no good for an atraumatic uh, insertion. That's correct. Well, okay. that is doubt yep. that, uh, there's no doubt that, that a robot insertion of a slower, more than, and potentially traumatic uh, insertion. What's not clear is does it a significant difference compared with the manual insertion? Because currently we actually get good early hearing patients, and our problem is in fact the delayed hearing that occurs in mesas and it's interesting to see if the robot changes that mm. at least with uh, if, if you insert manually with a hand and uh, there's inevitably always a bit of tremor and if, if you're approaching the critical areas the small the small movements actually can can make the trauma um, also in local anesthesia I made a scalar dislocation once in a patient, and uh, and uh, we also had had some uh, electrocochleography uh, of these patients, where where we see quite nice correlation to that. But actually, um, at 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 the stage of the surgery, you you don't have any any clue whether you you have done some harm or not. It was only just after scanning we, we could see that that there was a definitely a scalar dislocation at one 180 degrees insertion depth angle one of the one of the problems during uh, during insertion or after insertion is actually how to um, place the electrode without moving or uh, the lead of the electrode without moving the actual electrodes. Is there a particular trick when you use the robot, um, how to fix the electrode? Well, I actu actually, it is pretty easy, and I would say even easier than by hand. What you do is that you clip the electrode into the electrode holder, the instruments, and then very slowly with the robot, you just go down and then with a little fork you just guide the tip of the electrode to go into the round window uh, at the round window level and then you just progress manually a little more and then you start the robot put all your hands off and you let it go so i think i think it's even easier with extremely soft electrodes that we call them noodle electrodes and they you know they stick all over. No, it's very easy because the robot holds the electrode array and then with the just the tip, you manipulate it very gently. It is very, it's, I, I think, even easier than doing it by hand with the, the uh, what is called the, or the, the medal we use, the Femtex uh, forceps, and it's, it's even easier. Philippe, there's a question about um, resistance and the robot. Is there any sensor that will um, monitor the resistance it's, it, as, as the electrode goes in? Well, that would be actually the dream. And this is what we ask to uh, the engineer to perform. The problem is that it's extremely difficult to have a sensor now which is placed onto the instruments. And it's, it's uh, from what the engineer said, too big, but th you're right. It would be really, really uh, the, the dream to have these type of things. And then when you see that the pressure uh, or the forces are just rising, then the robot will stop and then adjust the speed of insertion to the uh, forces. But so far, it appears that technically it is a problem. Uh, I don't know, maybe engineers can solve it sometimes, but so far it's not available. But you agree. I think two things are, one is first of all, doing some electrocochleography and measurements. It's probably a good thing. The problem is that what to do if you see that the response is disappearing, do you go backwards? Do you stop for how long? That's one thing. And the second thing that is important also would be to get the forces. But again, uh, the forces are not available so far. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. I'd like to just thank everybody for a, a great panel discussion. I know there were a few technical problems 
with sound and we'll work on those for the sessions later in the day and tomorrow but i'd like to thank the panel who i thought gave a fantastic uh, and very interesting discussion uh, i think we're now going to have a short break from the panel discussions and we'll go back to professor grohlman and i think there's going to be a company presentation but thank you all so much thank, well, thank you. you thank, thank you, you. Otoplan is a revolutionary tablet-based otological planning software. Quickly and easily import DICOM files from packs or USB drives. Intuitive controls makes it easy to master Otoplan's advanced features. Otoplan's guided workflow simplifies 3D modeling and surgical planning. Easily create 3D reconstructions of otological structures, including facial nerve, corda tympani, and more. Otoplan lets you see exactly where you are going before you make the first cut. Otoplan makes it easy to achieve an ideal view of the cochlea and make consistent measurements. Choose the ideal electrode array for each patient for best hearing outcomes. The electrode visualization tool uses patient-specific data to show insertion depth and covered frequency of each electrode contact. Otoplan makes it easy to discuss the ideal electrode choice and surgical considerations with your patients. One step export feature automatically generates a full case report in PDF or PowerPoint format. Otoplan's post-op analysis feature makes it simple to perform a quality check and verify insertion status from post-operative images. Oui, Philippe Lefebvre ici. Ah, Michel, c'est toi qui m'appelais. D'accord, excuse-moi. C'est parce que je suis en, en congrès virtuel. C'est pour ça que je n'ai pas pu répondre.
Non, non, mais je veux dire, je, voilà, je sors ce nom-là parce que, parce que Paul est quelqu'un de... Ouais, il connaît bien les arcanes, il connaît... Il connaît... Bah, tu peux mettre les deux, là, puis ils sont mieux aussi. Voilà, mais c'est pas... Mais si, si tu veux avoir le numéro de téléphone de, de Paul, je l'ai, hein, c'est son portable. Et alors aussi autre chose, une dernière chose, une dernière chose, il connaît quand même bien le monde de la cardiologie parce que c'est un cardiologie. Et une des choses aussi, non, je ne sais pas si ça joue ou pas. Los pasos más sencillos que tiene el modelo actual con respecto al anterior es, número uno, que es menos profundo, menos, menos eh, entra menos dentro de la cavidad craneal, con lo cual eh, hay que fresar menos, y en segundo lugar, que es algo por lo que llevo luchando desde hace siete años, que tiene tornillos autorroscantes y autoperforantes, tornillos que se ponen en segundos, en, en 10-15 segundos está puesto cada tornillo. So we did now the first surgery and the first surgery uh, time was about 15 minutes from the incision to the skin to the closure to the skin. And this reflects, I think, the easiness of the surgery itself and also the safety of the surgery. So you don't have to deal with dura, you don't have to do with sigmoid sinus. To my knowledge, this implant at the moment is the best implant on the world. Right after a surgery now, the first impressions are great. Um, it's it's uh, fantastic to see uh, how uh, the company uh, uses the hints and, and the feedback of the surgeons to improve the implant. And so this is uh, like a, a symbiotic activity between uh, the developer and the ENT surgeon and uh, that's fantastic. Wir werden sicherlich mehrere Patienten damit versorgen können, weil es einfach einfach ist zu implantieren, weil es mehr Patienten gibt, die in diese Richtung gehen, die für dieses Implantat in Frage kommen und deswegen sind wir jetzt auch sehr glücklich, auch im Sinne von unseren Patienten, dass wir da einfach ein größeres Angebot haben bzw. eine größere Indikationsbreite. I just finished the first implantation of the new Bonebridge 602 and I'm really excited. Uh, all the work we put in the new design all together um, makes a great benefit and a great step ahead for that implant and uh, I'm looking really forward to tomorrow, uh, three more implantations and I'm really happy and uh, really excited about it.